So the 2012 scholarship physics paper, this is the briefer version. Question one, uh, on modern physics, we've got the charge and the electron speed of light and an experiment to investigate the photoelectric effect. Light of wavelength lambda is incident on a metal surface and a current is produced. The current is reduced by applying a potential difference V between the metal surface and the collecting plate. So it's our standard um, photoelectric effect experiment um, with a photovoltaic cell and a voltage supply to oppose that and then until you get zero current. And then you re, uh, record your um, your voltage for that frequency of light that's coming off and graph it. So anyway, part A, um, I, when the current is reduced to zero, derive an equation relating the wavelength, the voltage, uh, or the potential difference opposing it, and the work function of the metal, provide a full explanation of the derivation. So um, your classic photoelectric effect um, equation is what you'd be looking at here. <clears throat> um, except you need to explain it really, really carefully. So um, your intuition might take you straight to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is the kinetic energy of the emitted um, electrons is equal to the um, HF, which is the energy of the incident uh, photon of light. Okay, minus the energy required to get free from the metal. The work function is what phi is there on the end. So um, that's where you would start from, and then you can use um, uh, V equals uh, F lambda, with C being V as the speed of light, to make this H uh, C over lambda. Okay, so V equals F lambda, and you'd keep uh, phi as the same because that is the work function. You just need to explain these things. I'm only giving you the formula and the verbal explanation, um, but you would need to write down the explanation that I'm giving. So you'd have to explain that the work function is the amount of energy required or the work that has to be done on the electron um, to, uh, or done by the electron to remove itself from the metal, and then the remaining energy um, uh, from that, that's the original amount, there's the energy required to remove it from. The remaining energy is the kinetic energy of that electron. But we can do one step further, and um, because we're, we're needing to, we've already linked the wavelength and the work function, but we're needing to link the um, potential difference to energy. Um, if you remember, your voltage is the amount of energy per charge. So um, if we're trying to get uh, from energy, which is our kinetic energy here, to a, a voltage uh, part um, or way of representing that, um, we, would, we would write it as uh, V times E, E being the charge on an electron, which substitutes for our charge over here, um, and V being the voltage of the supply, which is opposing the current produced by the, um, or the voltage produced by the um, photovoltaic cell. So that would be enough to to um, give you that. <coughs> Excuse me. I guess there's one part you need to explain a little bit more, and that is um, why you're using this, and that is because the the voltage um, or the electric potential energy, if you like here, um, of the emitted um, electron um, would be. Um, equivalent to the voltage if you divide it by the charge for a single electron. Okay, I think that makes sense. Ponder that a little bit more yourself. Um, part two, this is actually just the same as for level three physics. A classic wave explanation uh, fails to explain the experimental results of the photoelectric effect. When they say a classical wave explanation, they're talking about the difference between classical physics and modern physics. So you might... Um, sort of group it um, in this way, classical versus modern. So classical physics um, would say that as you increase the intensity, you're going to also increase the kinetic energy of the emitted electrons. Um, you would, that doesn't happen. Um, under the modern uh, physics, uh, paradigm, in fact just the experimental, what it shows, when you increase the intensity um, you get more electrons and they have the same kinetic energy produced. Um, going back to the classical side, um, if you have 
uh, I'll just change colour so it's getting a bit clearer, low uh, intensity, you would expect it takes more time before you get an electron emitted. Okay, so because uh, with the wave, wave idea of, uh, um, of light, it's building up a, uh, a certain amount of energy in the system before it um, can give enough energy to the electrons to free it. But in the modern uh, physics paradigm, a decrease in the intensity, you would um, get instant emission for certain frequencies, in fact for high frequencies, and um, if you had uh, the, the low frequency, um, you would get zero uh, emission, even with a high intensity. So high intensity, you get zero um, emission. Okay. Um, so uh, the wave model definitely fails to explain this. A particle model, this is where you have to start talking about the particles of light, photons or wave packets of energy. Um, the particle model of light um, will account for this nicely because uh, different frequencies will have different um, uh, energies, E equals HF from that, and different energies of photons will be able to impart their energy to the electrons um, instantly to release and all of that. Okay, we're going to move on. You can explore those a little bit yourself and expand upon them a little bit more yourself. So, B, uh, we have a nucleus of mass uh, given there which is stationary with respect to an observer. Um, so if you read ahead you'll see there's relativistic effects as something speeds up, um, it gains mass. Um, but we're considering it stationary, that helps a little. The nucleus breaks into two equal parts with a total kinetic energy of 200 um, mega electron volts. Uh, that's times 10 to the 6 um, electron volts. And remember, one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules of energy. Um, the two parts are then brought to rest after they've um, had undergone fission. Calculate the total decrease in the mass in kilograms and therefore calculate the individual rest mass of the two equal masses. Okay, so this wants you to follow a particular way of doing this, but um, just to get the concept really clear here, um, the total mass, when it's together, so M together total, okay, minus the, um, the change in mass, and that change in mass is the, um, uh, the the mass that will be converted to energy later. That equals the uh, the mass of each of the two things as they are separate. So it's another total, but separate total. So we've got together total minus the change equals the separate total of mass. <coughs> that gives us an equation um, which we can. Uh, <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to work through the entire equation, but I'll give you uh, the parts for this. We've got the M together total up here, 3.93 times 10 to the minus 25. Um, <clears throat> so we would put that in, 3.93 times 10 to the minus 25. I like to put brackets around it to separate it. Minus the change in the mass. Change in mass is equivalent to... to um, with Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared. We've got the change in energy over c squared. And you're pretty much just working this through to find what the, the separate total mass will be, this, this part here, that's what we're aiming for. And then you divide that by 2. Okay, so you can't, you can't actually just chuck a divide into an equation like that, but it would be m separate total divided by 2, and that gives you the mass of the two, the individual rest mass of the two equal masses. Um, one tiny little trick is that this energy that you put into the equation has to be in joules. Okay, so units um, for the e equals mc squared equation. So you have to convert 200 mega times 10 to the 6 electron volts into joules. All you have to do is times by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. 
Okay, I haven't written it right clearly on there, but you get the idea. And then just follow it through. Okay. Part two. According to Einstein's special theory of relativity, the mass of an object with velocity relative to an observer is given by that equation. Um, I just want to highlight one thing because you might miss it, um, like I did the first time I looked through this. The, another form of writing this equation is m naught, the rest mass, divided by the square root of all that stuff in the brackets. Okay, so it's you're dividing by what's going on there. C is the speed of light, m naught rest mass, and that's when the velocity is zero. So you could plug that in. If you had velocity of zero in that equation, um, you'll just have one. So you'd just be dividing by the square root of 1, which is 1, and then the rest mass is equal to um, the mass at that velocity. Anyway, it says discuss the physical significance of this relationship, um, keeping, it <coughs> excuse me, keeping it relatively brief. Everything in that equation is always less than 1. Always less than 1. That means as soon as you have a velocity that is non-zero, you're, um, you're decreasing what's in the brackets, from 1 down to 0 if you had um, the velocity at the speed of light. Okay, so those are the limits of what we're working with them. And because you're square rooting that, you're still going to be dealing with a number less than 1, but you're dividing by a number less than 1, which will modify m naught by increasing it. So if you divide by a number less than 1, you increase it. That means um, the, the bigger the velocity, the closer you get to the speed of light, the closer m naught will be modified to become infinity. So the closer or the faster you go, so the, as v increases, m will also increase. Um, let's see if I've got everything. So, yeah, the closer to the speed of light that you get, um, as you approach the speed of light, the mass of the object will become... Um, closer to infinity. That's all they really want to know. You can get into a lot of details discussing the, the ends of that equation, but that's the essence of what they're after there. Now this last one, this is sort of the tricky one, makes use of a lot of things before, uh, from earlier. See, this is by considering the effects of special theory of relativity, the equation above, calculate the speed of the two masses in part one above before they are brought to rest. And the, as I was saying, the essence of this is that um, the rest mass, because you have to uh, find the, the rest mass to use the equation previously, the m equals m naught, 1 minus b squared over c squared um, to the negative half. Um, you have to use that equation, so you have to deal with the masses. You've got the rest mass, m naught, of, um, of one of those pieces. If you add to that the kinetic energy of one part, um, that should equal half of the original uh, mass, okay, um, which was at 3.93 times 10 to the minus 25 from the start there. So this is where you, where you have to work from. Um, we're actually mostly interested in, in this, so I guess you don't need that full equation, but um, that kinetic energy will be the change in mass times by c squared equals EK41. Okay. Um, what we then have to do is use our equation above to do that. So it's going to be, the change of mass is going to be m uh, uh, m naught uh, times by all that stuff in the brackets to the negative half. So the mass when it's moving. Okay. Minus the mass at rest. So that's going to give you delta m, the mass when it's moving minus the rest mass, um, times by c squared will give you the energy um, for that. Okay, and then we know the energy from the, uh, it'll be 100 mega electron volts. We can plug 100 mega electron volts into there, converting back to joules again, um, equaling all of that. So that's, we know c squared, we know m naught from the earlier question we calculated it. Uh, we know C, we just don't know the V in there, that's 1 minus. So uh, C squared, uh, V squared. So we've just got a one unknown in that whole equation now, um, and we can um, rearrange all of this to make that work. I guess you didn't need to know that first equation in total, but it's helpful because it gets you thinking in the right direction. 
Um, there we go.